everybody. Welcome to episode 31 of the Run to the Hills podcast. Today, Eddie has a great chat with Lindsay Collins all about Canny Cross. Uh, but first, Eddie and I will have a little, our little weekly catch up. How are you doing, Eddie? Good, thank you. How are you? Looks yeah, sunny. Right. It is. You know, we've got, um, we're in the middle of a bit of high pressure in the UK. <laughs> Lovely. Both physically and mentally. Yes. I listen to the radio too in the morning when I'm getting the kids off to school. And uh, they were saying this morning that it was sunshine, sunshine in the south, rainy in the north. (laughs) (laughs) I love listening to the weather and I like listening to the traffic reports. Yeah. M25, Junction 6. I'm like, oh, it's all (laughs) just the same. Oh my goodness, the M25. M25. And even in lockdown, it still was always Junction 6, jogger blocker. Yeah. So have you been out? Have you had the shorts on, tanning the legs? Always shorts. Um, oh. <laughs> always, yeah, literally. Uh, unless it's an event and I have to carry tights, I won't wear tights. <laughs> it's like, never, not never. even in. I'll have freezing. gloves and coats and everything, but the legs, legs are out. But yeah, this week, my goodness, what we've we done. So we've been really good again. The strength and conditioning. Um, done my glutes and my uh, core and my upper body. I'm neglecting the foam roller though, Eddie. While you're while you're on t- while you're watching TV, just yeah. No, but you know what? Sometimes you you've only got so much kind of you can take. Yeah. And I yeah. just want sometimes I just want to sit down and no, watch know. the weather and listen to the traffic reports <laughs> and stuff like that. But I've got Amazon have informed me it's on its way a massage gun, so maybe I'll be enthusiastic. I will be really interested to hear whether that works. I did look at one, but it was like 500 euros. I thought, no, I'm not going to get that past, mister. <laughs> no. um, but, and I did mention it to my massage therapist, but of course she was like, oh no, no, there's nothing like the hands-on approach. And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, that's fair because like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I do think, because foam rolling takes effort, doesn't it? And you have to move. Whereas in, you could just sit with that massage gun yeah, yeah. while you're watching um, Temptation Island, whatever you like watching. <laughs> I never my, I never foam roll. I'm pretty good with my back and my, my bum and my uh, hamstrings, but I never foam roll my calves. they quite <gasps> quite painful. Oh, you should. This, I know, they, I know. And it's the gun. one that's probably the least painful. Oh, I don't know. Oh. when i put my body weight when i do like a single calf roll oh that's quite painful but yeah we'll see what the massage gun holds when it arrives it was supposed to turn up yesterday um but it didn't. the postman's got it he's in his van going Go amazon's got it. yeah he's pre- previously enjoyed the massage gun <laughs> <laughs> that's did. all wrong i wrong <laughs> i know <laughs> <laughs> well, we did what did you do? Uh, yeah, oh, we did the 400s. Um, 10 times 400 with a 30 second recovery. That was that was okay. And then I did, uh, it was supposed to be a Are your hamstrings minutes. sore after that when you've run fast like that? No, where they were sore was after my, I did this threshold run and it was all downhill. Oh, I to show it. well, that was it. But my goodness me, my calves, but it's really sore after that. And then Sunday we did a Traily Fartlex, Rex and I out in the dean again. Oh. It was great. Yeah, really good week. I ruined myself last week. <laughs> so I know last week I talked about doing these higher intensity s- sessions on my skis. So I'd done one and then I had to do another one. So I had three big skis last week. Normally I do three to five skis depending on the conditions, but yes. um, so I only did three, but they were long. And then normally I can do two two good runs as well and did I even do one oh, I did one I you know it's a lot I got the run you know when you got the session I use final surges in my as my training yeah uh, log yeah. and I kept moving the session <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm gonna move that another day you were not I, skis really anyway on Saturday I was like right okay I've got it it's on the treadmill I've just got to get on it and do it and it was just awful. It yeah. was just, it was just, my legs were dead. I haven't felt like that for a long time. I very nearly didn't do it. I was like, on the, I'm going to stop. This is just too, I'm just too tired. Yeah. And then, of course, you get, you get I had 10 lots of four minutes to do. Uh, oh, it just seemed a mountain after like four. I was like, oh yeah. my God, I got to do this. But of course, you get into it. And then yeah. by like, by like eight or nine, I was like, 
oh, it's not so bad. <laughs> anyway, I got it done. Um, and yeah, it was. So I, I, I don't think I went too hard on the skis. I just think I didn't, I don't think I, which I think lots of people do. I didn't um, uh, respect them and yeah. thought because skiing is normally, you know, I kind of see it as a good time as well as training, but that was yeah. proper training. And I come back and I, you've missed a meal. <laughs> Yes, that's true. To yeah. me, because I start at like half past eight and I don't finish till about two. Come home, have a shower, yeah. get changed, go and get the kids, and then it gets to like half past seven, and yeah. I'm not really refueled properly. Oh wow! And I'm like this <laughs> face is like this color of tomato. I think I spoke to you one day, didn't I? After it, and my face was like, I was like, do I need foundation? Um, so uh, this week I I did a big one again yesterday. It was so hot. So it started off freezing minus four which isn't yeah. freezing for here but right now it feels quite cold so I started off with like two layers on my rucksack gloves going up the peak it was so hard it's like yeah. concrete and my skins kept slipping oh. so I had to start talking to myself because I was <laughs> I started getting a little bit scared so I was like go on Eddie well done Eddie well done <laughs> Not her. But then I was listening to a podcast about how self-talk, if we take ourselves outside our head and talk to ourselves as yeah. a third person, it's a very good way to overcome fears and to rationalize yeah. things. Yeah. So I was like, well, there we go. You're not yeah, some crazy yeah. lady. <laughs> and then by the time I finished, it was 22 degrees oh and I was goodness. literally in my pants. Not literally, because that, that would put people off. I was so hot. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I got to the top of the last climb and I just lay face down in this like ice cold snow <laughs> oh it was the best that's so, an amazing shift in temperature though My amazing goodness. i mean what i was like next time i think i'm gonna have to like change take a change of clothes for halfway yeah. round. um and I, you can't really start any earlier because it is so icy yeah that it's quite dangerous going up and they're not the dis they're coming down is horrible yeah, yeah. because your skis are already they're lighter than normal skis so you're just like <laughs> down um so but after that took my recovery shake which i always do but then i came back husband had made homemade vegetable soup oh yes <laughs> what a ledge loads of bowls of that really constant and then today instead of thinking i'm my recover i've been really good proper recovery run proper jogging and um with the dog taking it really easy with the dogs um Ooh. so and i've got another one to do and I've got, got to try and do a run session tomorrow. But this is what it's all about, isn't it? Stress, you stress yep. the body, recover, push it again. And already the one yesterday, the harder ski, it felt easier yeah. than a couple of times before. That's good. So That's what it's all about. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. Today, let's talk about our favorite friends. Yes. Our, Sometimes our, our only friends. Yeah. <laughs> no. I spend more time with Rex than anybody. <laughs> you know, it's Porter, dear. <laughs> Oh, no. I know he did a little yelp and I looked down and everybody around me looked like, what have you done to the dog? And uh, I checked his paws, he was fine. Then he just was immediately trying to drag me off down the street again. So I don't know. I think he just a little thorn or maybe a little bit of glass or something. I don't know. Sometimes sometimes mine get, in the winter, they get snow. When it's really, really cold, it freezes between their paws. Oh. And then they come and bring me the paw and I have to like pull out between <laughs> their claws and then they'll like, see anything that slows them down. We're talking about our dogs, everybody, in case you're wondering, we're not talking about our other halves. So, <laughs> so a big thing that we have in common is that we love, we love running with our dogs and we love our dogs and they're a big part of our life. So we thought this episode, we would talk all about dogs. Um, I have a lovely chat with Lindsay Collins, who runs North Yorkshire Canny Cross Club, all about Canny Cross how to train your dog to run with you, some really good training tips. Uh, anybody that knows me and my training pals who run or ski with me out here know I have an older dog. Yeah, perhaps we should talk about our dogs, Gary. You want to talk about Rex? I'll, do, I'll tell about mine and then you tell about Rex. Yeah. I have an older dog. Um, she's a lab cross. We don't know. Her mum went out, had a good time, came back, had three puppies. And I had a mate who said, do you want a dog? So she came to live with us um, randomly. And we've had her for, we're not, I can't quite remember, about nine years. And she's been a, a constant running companion of mine for for that long, really, until they're about a year and a half when they can start running. And I don't, very rarely can count the number of fingers runs that she's not come with me. But now she's definitely slowing down. She's fine on the trail. Yeah. 
But like this morning, it was quite icy. So I ran up the trail. And then when I came back, I just ran the last half a mile on the road. And she yeah. goes, she's like sulking, like in the PE <laughs> class. She's like, oh, I'm not running. I'm not running down the road. I'll walk and I'll just see at home because I'm old and I don't like running that fast. Yeah. Um, and so exactly this time last year, we welcomed in a short haired uh, German pointer called Lindere, which is um, the name of a little village near us and our favorite ski piste. And she is nuts, proper <laughs> nuts. She's known locally as Jump Jump because she oh, just right. jumps everything. She's crazy. She sees somebody, you're her best friend. When I'm running, I'm like, she's fine until somebody says hello to her. And yeah. then she's like, oh my God, can we be friends? Can we be friends? Hi, 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 hi. So whenever I'm running, I'm like, please just don't acknowledge the dog. Don't acknowledge. After about 20 minutes, she comes down. She's great. My friends are very long suffering that come training with me because that she greets them and then won't stop greeting them. <laughs> um, but wonderful training partners. I love them. I love them. And also they drive me bat- mad and equal. I think of Rex as your friend who you love them, but then they're the first to get drunk or maybe I don't get into a fight at a bar or something like that. Or, I don't know, smash a window, just do something daft, but you, you want to disown them, but then they do something and you think, oh my goodness, you'll be just the best. Tell us, um, tell us how Rex came into your life. He's a rescue dog. We got him from the Dogs Trust near us, uh, just near a place called Darlington. We wanted a Spaniel, but the police, the police had him already before we had a chance to look at him. So he must have showed a lot of promise. And then they, uh, I saw a picture of Rex and thought, yeah, let's take a little look at Rex. That was that. That was his name. You know, we didn't change his name or anything. And it was amazing. I was going to ask you that. Cool name. Yeah, cool yeah. Name. I thought, man, there's literally, that's like the best dog name <laughs> to get a classic old school dog name. So we kept his name. And I think I mentioned before, I really didn't want a dog. Not because I dislike pets or anything like that. I just knew the time commitment mm. and was really kind of worried if uh, we could give it the life we wanted to give it. He must be about four now. Yeah, I was going to ask how old he was. So you didn't yeah, know yeah. when you no, got it's, him. Yeah, they give you a kind of an estimation. I think when he's been to the vets and stuff, they say, yes, that's probably probably about right. He's a, a Staffordshire Collie Cross. He's got the chase instinct. Let's just say that. Ooh. <laughs> and he's fine. You know, he's, he's really sociable. Um, he will bark quite a lot. And I, I imagine if you didn't know Rex, you might feel quite intimidated. But he just really just wants to say hello. He's never once gives any kind of reason to think you couldn't trust him to be around mm. somebody but if he sees uh men on bikes he goes crazy he really i'm not too sure what it was. he's okay with children on it like a child on a bike but something about a, a fast moving bike i have to kind of consciously rein it in with his mm. money because it's mm. so easy just to take him out and i think i, I listened to another podcast uh, about dogs you might think they're fine but the dogs just want to please so they will literally run themselves into the into the ground sometimes. But uh, my wife, Lisa, doesn't like running with him because he pulls so much. So it's quite unpleasant for her. And uh, just in the interview, I think Lindsay said it's like a little bit of a deal you do with the dog. It's not just them pulling you. You've got to put a shift in too. So, yeah, we marry up quite well and our run's great. <laughs> so if you do you let him off the lead if you're just going for a walk? Or is he no, always... No. We have no. a few times at the seaside, you know, if there's no, say, roads nearby or anything like that, we're pretty confident, you know, even if you did see another dog, it's a situation we could manage. But your dogs seem quite obedient. Uh, you let them off. <laughs> I'm going to say yes, and anybody that knows a dog will go. Yeah. Yeah, well, we don't. I do let them off most. Of the day. We we put Lindy on the Tarka, the older one. Never go. She just um, she's never really been on the lead since we've yeah. been here. The French are very different about their dogs. Their dogs just wander. They okay. do, and and also <clears throat> don't really have fences in our. We have made a fence to keep yeah. Lindy in in our little bit of land, but they don't really fence their houses or their gardens, okay. and their dogs just run free. Um, so it's sort of like a different approach to dog, and they just yeah. leave. I mean, there's the Cafour dog we have who just wanders around the supermarket all day, and we presume <laughs> she lives somewhere there. There's a big shepherd dog that lives just up the road that just lives outside on the porch all year round in the freezing cold. <laughs> and then in the summer, it goes up the mountain, and we see it on the mountain. It's like the dogs are just kind of like just yeah. le- left a little bit more feral than, than we kind of used to in England. So, yeah, I, I our dogs are, they, don't, they don't run away. I do rampage is what I'd say as I'm running along the trail. If there's somewhere where I know where there would be like marmots or um, 
uh, the big alpine cows. Yeah. But yeah. they're so big, the dogs are quite intimidated by yeah, those. Yeah. Um, but they're pretty used to just running along. I think the running action, they tend to stay with you better yeah. than than on a walk and both oh, Rex is much better yeah if we're running um a walk sometimes with Rex because I think he's pre-programmed now just exactly to I think we've trained them to become these um yeah to become these like running machines so that we're a walk is like well what do we do a bit like us when we yeah, go for a walk yeah. we're like this is so slow we've done like a mile um let's I listen think- to the interview with uh with Lindsay all about her experience, her lovely story of how her dog um got her running and how she's now become uh, a canny cross expert. Lots of tips and tricks if you want to get into running with your dog or you just want to hear her lovely story of um, her and her dogs. I'm so excited this week to have Lindsay on the podcast to talk everything about dogs and canny cross. And perhaps we should put a little warning on before, if you don't have dogs, this might be, uh, well, this, we could sell it to you if you, if you don't run with dogs and haven't ever run with a dog. Truly, uh, both Gary and I are big dog lovers and do a lot of running with our dogs. So hi, Lindsay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eddie. It's so exciting to be here to talk all about dogs <laughs> all about dogs i just said to you right we need to be we'll be about half an hour and i know we're going to be about three hours and poor gary will have to edit it so just just to start off with a little bit can you tell me a little bit about well first of all i think you should introduce your dogs a little bit about your dogs and how and what is this canny cross that you are trying to convince me to do with my dogs fantastic yeah absolutely so i have uh, four dogs um so i oh. have yeah. Or, I know I'm a spaniel collector officially. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I have, uh, yeah, so Charlie and Seth are both working cocker spaniels. Uh, Arthur is a working cocker crossed with a Springer spaniel. Uh, and then Stanley, who's our youngest, he is a spaniel crossed with something leggy. We're not sure. Um, oh, possibly Stanley! Stanley's already my favourite. <laughs> he's adorable well they're all adorable um so yeah so they're all pretty active dogs you know spaniels are pretty um active um so canny cross um is uh, so it sounds like canine cross country um so i never about- knew that i'm already learning so, no. <laughs> so it's about running with your dogs but it is about kind of trail running so the kind of cross country side of it um means that generally you will be running on trails so you're kind of forest paths or um moorland um up and down uh, hills and fells and uh, you know maybe fire tracks uh, through forests things like that um so it is more about cross-country running than running on roads um which can be quite hard on their, their joints and their paws um and it, it came from so originally it was for people who worked kind of sled dogs and off season it was a really great way of cross training uh, your dogs was to to run with them rather than be out on uh, kind of sleds and things like that um, but it's become a really popular um ju- just dog sport for your average dog owner um as well as people who are really keen to train their dogs and race with their dogs and and kind of do that that kind of cross training um element um it's it's different to just going out for a run with your dog um so it's not quite the same as just going out for a run and your dog's just off lead running with you um it's uh, a bit different because your dog is attached to you um so you wear a running belt uh, which sits kind of just on your hips um your dog is wearing like a sporting harness so a, a, a harness that's non-restrictive uh, and then you have like an elasticated bungee line that that joins you um joins you together and the idea is then that you're running together as a partnership um so your dog's running out front um you know putting some tension on the the line so they're giving you a bit of assistance um but you are kind of keeping up the your side of the bargain as well by um running with them um so it is very much a, a kind of team effort uh, really um and I suppose I got into Canny Cross uh, with my oldest dog. So Charlie's 12 now. He's actually retired from Canny Cross. Um, 
so he's no longer a canny cross dog. Um, does he, he does he commentate on it now instead? <laughs> All less that. Uh, <laughs> He watches the other leave and leave and go, uh, have fun, guys. He's like, I'm out. Like <laughs> yeah. So he's quite happy. He will get a little trot on sometimes when we're, we're out. But, um, yeah, he uh, developed arthritis quite young, um, did Charlie, and um, don't really know uh, why. But we started having to lead walk him because we found off lead mm. he was just, yeah. run like bilio and then he would be, be late yeah. yeah right so um we kind of chatted with the the vet and you know said this could this be something so we can control the the speed uh we can control the kind of exertion um and so started running um with uh charlie so i wasn't a runner previously um oh, i'm loving this story <laughs> at all yeah so uh literally not at all so i um i was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome when i was 12 so i did no sport at all um through kind of my teenage years and the early kind of adulthood um and uh yeah so wasn't uh, at all sporty um and decided well you know if my arthritic dog can run maybe i'll i'll give it a go um and yeah somehow got a bit um kind of hooked really um thanks to hard Moors, which i know there's lots of hard Moors yeah. runners listen to this um this podcast um yeah so we signed up about a couple of months after we started running we signed up to our first 10k which was in the days when you could sign up for a hard Moors race like three weeks before uh, rather than in the first three minutes of the entry going live yeah. um, and uh, also it was before i knew that 10k wasn't 10k in the hard Moors, uh world 24k uh, yeah right so we had a very long first race with me and charlie together and um it yeah it was exhausting and we loved it we both loved it and became hooked really after that yeah and then and then you got did you have other dogs then that you were then like did you train them from when they were little onto the onto the canicross because the thing that terrifies me um so i've got a older dog who taka who is a, who is a lab cross we don't know uh, her uh -huh. mum went on a special uh on a disco night um we've never known uh, she brings it up occasionally that she didn't know her dad. It was a tough upbringing. Um, but she's she's sort of eight, eight, nine now. She's sort of happy just to, she, to trot. But, but my Lindy, who's my German shorthead pointer, I think this is the sport for her because she is mad. But uh -huh. it's the madness that slightly scares me because having her attached to me, and also what, I'm not, and people, probably people listening as well that run with their dogs is I take on the lead if I'm on the road and then the whole run, she's just free. So well, how do you then, how, when your other dogs arrived, what did, did you sort of train them from them when they were puppies and yeah, how do you start so, the relationship? Sure. So, um, my, so two of my dogs were kind of adult dogs. So Seth was an adult dog when he, um, uh, started doing uh, canny cross as well so he was probably um five when he started okay. uh, started running um my other dogs um have been younger um but ideally you don't want to start canny crossing with your dogs until they are at least a year old often about 18 months old mm. depending on the size mm. of the dog mm. um, because what you want is for the dog to be fully developed yeah. in terms of yeah. their, their kind of joints things like that um so i always say you know get a vet check um ask the vet specifically say you want to run with them like in harness um so that they can check all their joints but they can also check you know heart and lungs and things like that to That's check their fit yeah. healthy um so getting that vet checks important and you know my vet they know that i can cross so they do those checks regularly mm. um and we see a, a physiotherapist a canine physiotherapist every six months um for kind of maintenance and things like that just you know because they are active dogs and i want to run with them for a long time so i want to keep them fit and healthy um so yeah when you're starting out get that vet check um and then really it's about building up um quite slowly because 
although your dog might run for you know 10 miles off lead um running in harness is is quite different mm. um because when they're off lead they will do some sprinting they'll do some walking they'll stop and sniff something um you know their gait is changing all the time whereas when you're running in harness you're expecting them to maintain a certain pace it's that more repetitive kind of movements um, and you're expecting concentration for quite a long you know a longer period of time even if you're running a 5k you know but even for super speedy people who run like a sub 20 minute 5k you know 18 20 minutes for a dog to stay focused you know you have to build up to that you mm. can't expect them to just do it straight away yeah um, so we want to build up in terms of fitness um but also in terms of that that kind of concentration and and uh, you know learning that this is a new enjoyable job for them to do you know it's something to kind of keep them um active so we want to build up that but from any age you can start and work on the commands that you need for canny cross and um, so even from you know young uh, dogs um i would normally say from kind of 10 months onwards i would start introducing my dogs to a harness so they would be in a, a sporting harness um, and i would start introducing those commands um that we're then going to use um more at speed because it's easier to teach them at a slower speed of walking kind of hiking speed um than it is to teach going them to <laughs> yeah <laughs> right exactly exactly so yeah we can start teaching them so we teach kind of direct commands so um, yeah what are the sort of key i'm basically trying to just get some free tips here for me yeah, no right? <laughs> what are the sort of key where do you start because i'm sure as well it'd be really handy for people that run with dogs and i i know i'm guilty of it because my because when you run with dogs it's very they just sort of follow you because you're at that speed yeah. i've never really trained them in any way because we just go running and because you're not sort of walking they're sort of always got their eye on you because you're moving quite quick so i but i would like them to maybe respond to me <laughs> okay yeah, absolutely so yeah as you say when they're running off lead you you do, the only thing you want really is that they'll come to you but when they're on lead then yeah you want to to train them so they know what you want them to do so you can use commands um use your voice um and also use your positioning on the trail so if i'm properly gasping i know if i move over to the left of the trail my dog's going to move over with me because oh, they they wow. feel the change on the yeah. lead and that yeah they're going to do and you know they're all now experienced uh canny cross dogs so they you know they they try and read my mind i catch them out sometimes by giving them a command they weren't expecting to check they're listening to me um but we would start so one of the really important things is is um kind of using your canny cross kit just for canny cross um so your dogs learn that this is different um okay. so this is different to going on a walk where i stop and have a sniff of things or um you know dart into the bushes to flush out pheasants or what my dogs like to do um, spaniels spaniels oh, yeah yeah absolutely one of mine when i'm going uphill he's like you're so slow mum. i'm just gonna flush <laughs> out this pheasant at the side of the path but i'll be right back with you um so he's uh yeah very special uh, little arthur he's very good at that he makes his own mistakes. <laughs> um, so teaching that kind of focus is, is really um, helpful and having kind of a we're setting off running command. So I use um, ready. Some people use line out, which means go to the end of your line. Um, so I can be at a race and my dogs are just hanging around at my feet and then I'll go to them. Are you ready? And they're at the end of their line because they're like, oh, okay, no, we're ready to go. Um, so as soon as I say you ready, they're there at the end of their line and they're, you know, facing forwards, focused um, on what they're doing. Um, and then we can start and teach and say kind of direction commands are the, the next kind of thing that I would teach. And you can teach those just on a walk. You know, when there's a natural turn in the path, when your dog's about a meter and a half two meters from that turn um you would then say because they're naturally going to go that way so you can just then start and use the command so you say you know your left or your right um and you know as they're naturally turning you're saying left and then you're saying you know yes or good um something to kind of uh, reward them that they've done it right um so you can start and then um do that when they're naturally going to turn and then start and use it more as a, a kind of instruction um so you know you might be approaching somewhere where there's a straight on or a left and you will then direct them that that's the way you want them to to turn um so working on those directions are helpful for turns but also for 
overtaking um, if you want them to move over on the trail, um, or in my case, being overtaken where I want them to keep to the side of the trail while other people um, go very fast uh, past me. Um, well, this, is, this is all brilliant because we have, lo- in the winter, the skiers are coming past us on the trail. And so if I, if I and I often work, like just move them, want them to move over to the side or yeah. they need to, or they get used to things coming past them really quick and they know that's not the thing to chase yes stay back stay with mama absolutely yeah so using kind of a a keep left or a keep right and we train that using kind of wider paths where um we're then moving from side to side um and you know as they're moving with us we're then using those commands to kind of teach them that that's what we want them to to do um so yeah those are really helpful and then we have kind of speed that was my um, next question. How yeah. do you control the speed once they yeah. get the bit between their teeth and they're like, we're going, we're going. Especially when I imagine a, in a race of the lots of dogs, is this yeah. not just carnage? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it is about then teaching your your dog what you want them to do. You know, as they, I, yeah, if I, I try to not really go to big canny cross events because it can be quite overwhelming because there's a lot of dogs kind of lunging at the end of their lines, like barking and super excited to go. And my dogs are all pretty quiet. So um, I tend to go to kind of human races that allow you to run with a, with a dog. Which I think um, will probably be a lot of listeners will be nodding going, yeah, I'd love to be able to go to sort of to, to do an ultra with my dog or, um, and more and more races now are dog friendly as more and more yeah. people are, I heard on the radio today there's three million new pets in the UK after lockdown. So I think there is lots of dogs. Anyway, let's go back. How, let's just talk, we were just going on to the speed. So you're running with your dog. You've got it going. You're going left, you're going right. But then it's going really fast. Or not fast enough. So, yeah, either. Absolutely. So what I would say is, I know it seems pretty scary, um, like when when you're thinking about starting out. If you've got the right kit, it really makes a massive difference. Because what people are maybe used to is maybe running with their dog's lead in their hand, Mm. um, which means that they're, you know, it's pulling you forwards. It can be Mm. quite painful, but it also knocks you off balance. So you can't get in a good running stride because you're being pulled from one side. Um, Or sometimes people have maybe tried putting the lead around the waist um you know so the dog's kind of attached to them but what happens then is it's pulling you from your middle which again affects your your balance as you're running and it affects your posture so the the kind of canny cross belts they sit just kind of on or just below your hips so they're they're basically kind of around your bottom um so when your dog pulls it's pulling you from your pelvis Mm. so it automatically pulls you hips forward so it means then you're nice and upright it means you've got your arms free for for kind of powering yourself forwards and you can get your legs moving in a kind of symmetrical way you're not that kind of off balance by them pulling one side um so although it can seem pretty scary when you're thinking about it when you've got the right kit i remember the first time i put on a canny cross belt and my dog pulled and i thought Oh, actually, I can do this. Like this, oh, yeah. this is okay. Um, and you know, my Charlie, who I started running with, he weighs like 19 kilos, so he's not a small spaniel. You know, when he goes, he's got a lot of pulling power. Um, but it, it it feels much more comfortable when you've got that that kind of right kit on. Is there a specific um, is there a specific harness that you like? Um, so uh, in terms of a belt that I yeah. would wear, yeah, the kind of human side of things. Um, there's a couple I really like. There's one called um, iDog, which um, it's, uh, so iDog is a brand. It's called a Canyon Belt. And I really like that one. It's it's quite, um, it's quite chunky, um, but lightweight. But I, I feel that when you've got a strong pulling dog, it feels really secure. Mm. Um, so that's one of the ones I, I really like. Um, for those in the UK, there's a fantastic uh, UK-based um, company um, called Kizzy, K-I-S-I. Um, and they're a really good UK um company who make um uh belts and and harnesses and things like that um so there's a um kind of thinner they're not quite as chunky as the eye dog one but um they're they're really good running belts i i run in both of those so they're my kind of my favorite ones and they're pretty good for beginners because they're easy you just 
they have kind of leg straps on them. They look a bit like a climbing yeah, harness. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Um, I mean. So legs in, put them to your hips and and fasten the clip, and you're you're kind of done. So you know they're quite easy to to fit really. Um, so they're the ones that I I really like, and they do make it easier with a kind of stronger um, pulling dog. But also they allow that if you do need to slow down, you can kind of lean into the belt. Okay. Um, so that then that can put a bit more pressure on the the line, which helps your dog to to know that you're wanting to to kind of slow a little bit. Um, but also, you know, I just I I start by marking the different speeds. Um, so I will use just kind of let's go for setting off. Um, if I want my dogs to, if my dogs then start galloping, I'll say, yes, push, push. So push, push is what I use, which means some people use high con. Um, <laughs> my dog, okay. Lindy's just gone, oh, this sounds cool. I can push. <laughs> I can do that. Um, so for me, push means pull harder um, okay. to kind of push on. Um, so once they start to gallop, I'll kind of go, oh, yes, you know, push, push, yes. And I'll kind of mark that. And then as they slow down, I'll go easy. So I'm teaching them that when I say yeah. easy I want them then to to slow down um and then I also teach my dogs a um back command um which means run behind me so that when I'm on those really technical downhill sections and I just want my dog behind me um then I I teach them that and I teach them that walking um okay so I find a nice downhill section with a narrow path um so they can't get past me very easily um I get them behind me and then I will walk down there with them and I'll be telling them you know back back yes you know that that's what I want them to do um and then I start to build up that I start to get a little bit faster I start to jog then mm. I start to run. but they know to um, stay back because that was one of the things, wasn't it, when I said to you that I'd love to do this, but I was a bit <laughs> like the technical, a lot of the paths around here are so technical, but actually having that control on your dog on a technical path is so much better than what I currently do, which is they just make their own way down because it can be dangerous um, and other people and wildlife and stuff and actually having that control of yeah. your dog. And I, I was just thinking as well as when Lindy is two next winter, I'd love to take a skiing. But yeah. I, do you definitely, I see lots of people ski touring with their dogs, but then you see lots of dogs with cut paws and ligaments because they've run in front of the skier. Um, and so actually starting on the lead and training her up to then all those yeah. commands, then I can put that onto the skis absolutely i would always start with with running because some people will um yeah ski or bike or scooter yeah. with their dogs um but you know that is you're going at much higher speeds um and so you i would always say you know i start teaching those commands at a walking pace yeah um, and then i start at a running pace and then you can start and introduce kind of um yeah skis bikes scooters things where you're going to be moving at, at much speed. absolutely absolutely um you know and, and with different dogs you know i think it's always about um what's right for the dog mm. um so you know one of my dogs will run all day at a beautifully steady trot so he was my he did my first ever marathon with me um and uh, we finished it together we ran the whole distance together and he just trotted in front of me beautifully the whole way um but if i asked him to do a fast 5k he wouldn't enjoy it that's not his thing um you know he's just not interested whereas my two younger dogs um will do both so we'll happily do um well a fast 5k for me they knock about three minutes off my 5k oh, time wow yeah um, i was going to ask <laughs> what's, the, what's the difference in the pace when you've got your dogs yeah. on full yeah so i'd say 5k and 10k they definitely make me quicker so long as they've been to the loo before you start <laughs> um then they definitely make me um me quicker over kind of five and 10k distances so say they probably look about three minutes off my 5k um time um and probably five minutes off my my 10k um time anything above that i would say that the um the speed that they add um, and the kind of help, the assistance that they give is massively outweighed by the fact that they stop to go to the loo. Sometimes they want to stop for a drink or a swim. Um, I have to carry probably an extra couple mm. of kilos worth of stuff for them because I have to carry water for them. I carry a first aid kit for them. I carry like a, if I'm up in the hills, I carry an emergency uh, carrier in case one of them's injured and I have to carry them three miles back to the car. Um, so, you know, all 
the extra kit that you you carry um things like going over styles you know it takes longer than just getting the yeah. person over the style um so i'd say anything over 10k i would say that the the speed increase is probably they probably slow me down more than mm. they speed me up it's overall. the company it's the company then isn't it over a longer distance um what sort of things do you feed them if you're out on that um on that on a sort of longer longer walk to keep their energy up just like us yeah and do you so feed them at the same sort of interval you have a snack they have a snack do you kind of oh well i mean mainly because spaniels won't let you snack without feeding them <laughs> yeah. Hello. not necessarily my choice um, they just give you the eyes um the, the spaniel eyes that mean i'm starving um but because dogs kind of digest food differently to humans they don't really need so much extra food when they're actually out running and you mm. need to be really careful not to feed them too much because they can um suffer with real stomach issues yeah if they're you know, if you're, you're feeding them and running. So normally, like if I'm doing a race that starts at eight in the morning, I'm up at five to feed my dogs. Be so they've got a good three hours um, before they're actually going to run. Um, on a run, even a marathon run, I don't really give them extra food during the run. They'll have mm. snacks. So yeah, they, biscuits, they a snacks. couple of biscuits or something. Yeah, well, and they often, I often carry ginger nut biscuits because they love a ginger <laughs> nut biscuit. So I just then will, you know, eat half and they get the other half um, of that. Um, but I sometimes, um, you know, carry some extra snacks for them. And they usually, at the end of a, a longer run, um, I feed them uh, sardines. So just canned sardines. Okay. Um, so I often have a can of sardines in my um bag because they're really you know the the fish oils are good for them they've got some you know fat protein really omega threes this i mean Absolutely. you should be sharing this snack as well really well i'm vegetarian so fishy, I post ultra for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm vegetarian so my dogs actually eat a raw meat diet do, oh, my dogs? do they um, so yeah so that it keeps them pretty fit but i might give them you know a bit extra um for their the evening meal or their supper if they've done a long a long run but generally with dog it, dogs it's more about over time thinking about mm. making sure that they've got enough um enough nutrition really um so yeah so they'll have little snacks but nothing really significant um as we're as we're running um they would tell you they're starving yeah they're, they're, they're funny dogs aren't they often wouldn't eat it anyway i know mine if i'm out on a big yeah. day in the mountains i mean they would yeah. if you have a if we go on a picnic with the kids and we're having sandwiches and crisps they'll be like oh my god yeah i have some of those pringles but then you're like well i bought your food with and they're like no i'll have that tonight that's not for yeah. now it's sandwiches like what you humans are having now absolutely absolutely um <laughs> so what's the furthest you've ever run with your with with one of your dogs uh so two of my dogs have run marathons so two of them are kind of marathon uh distance dogs um so the kind of middle two are um and uh, stanley the youngest he's up to about 17 18 miles now um so probably by the end of this year he'll probably be kind of at, at marathon distance um it I kind of then, as I do longer races, I relay them. Um, so my wonderful husband and mum, they are very used to meeting me in the middle of nowhere to swap dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, that works quite well because, you know, do dogs can run long distances depending on the, the dogs. Some dogs, I've, I've got a friend whose dog kind of gets to 10 miles and goes, I'm kind of done. Like yeah, 10 miles is fine for me. Yeah. Um, whereas other dogs will, you know, run ultra marathons, uh, no problem um and my so seth probably would but because i started him older he's going to be 10 this year um so you know I, I wouldn't if i'd started him younger i expect he would have run ultra mm. kind of distance um with me but i tend to now relay them so um you know they might run 15 20 miles of a race with me but then i'll relay and get other ones which is really nice actually getting a fresh dog um <laughs> it's just like oh, changing run your running like friend little... isn't it you're like yeah we've had a chat now next one yeah. in absolutely yeah like a little boost but i tell you when you're you know 30 40 miles in and you get a fresh dog and they're like fresh as daisies and you're like okay mommy has already <laughs> run 40 miles um just calm down a little yeah. bit but they have no idea <laughs> How, what what sort of plans have you got this year if any um to do any adventures with the dogs 
Yeah, so uh, I suppose after last year, I mean, we did really well last year. We, we tried to really keep up our, our training. Um, we're really looking forward to getting out with groups um, mm. again, you know, running with other people and doing events and things like that. So I am signed up this year to the Hardmore's um, Grand Slam. I um, <gasps> did not this know this. Oh my, so yeah. what's, what does that involve? What races does that involve? Um, so that is the Hardmore's 30, the 55, the 60 and the 110. So the furthest I've done before is I did the 60 last year. So that was my longest um, race. Uh, and I I was, um, I missed out on a place this year uh, on the 60. So the only way to enter it was to enter the slam. Um, <laughs> so in order to run 60 miles, I also have to run all the other distances <laughs> as well. Um, uh, so I'm totally sucked in. John and Shirley Steele have a lot to answer for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so they will be training with me and they will um, relay with me. But some of the uh, longer ones, I will run sections of it without a dog um, as well. Um, so that's kind of my plans for them. Stanley, I'd like to get up to towards marathon distance. I think he would be capable of that, but he's still quite young. So if it takes another no year, rush. It, yeah. it doesn't bother me. Um, and then I've got lots of plans for other people's dogs. Um, so I do. So you do some training. Them. You do training with other people's right. dogs, do you, or classes? Yeah. So I, I run a just a small business, North Yorkshire Canny Cross, um, and we do um, classes. So we do some kind of couch to 5K classes. We do. Um, also kind of skills based classes so for beginners and for uh, more advanced uh, canny crossers um to work on kind of skills and fitness and things like that and then i do kind of adventure um sessions as well so like adventure runs and adventure hikes where we go to more interesting places slightly longer distances but a more kind of social um as well so not necessarily skills based but we try and build in some kind of trails that are going to um be a bit more interesting for for people as well so um i've not been able to do yeah, those so much yeah. uh, during um lockdown but we've got our first ones uh, scheduled in for april uh, for this year so um yeah so that's kind of my my plans really to yeah work with my own dogs but get other people coming along with me and seeing all the wonderful different uh dogs i love to see all the different breeds of dogs that uh, that come along and, and join in and it's wonderful to see them all all run and see new people new partnerships and people getting excited about going out with their dogs yeah well, you're awesome you must be you're such an inspiration from saying you know you didn't run and then you you and charlie went on this journey together and now you've become like wow what a what a i could talk to you all day a font of knowledge about everything of dogs and running and and how you've managed it and how you you the partnership that you've grown with your dogs but also what they've given you as a runner um and confidence probably out on the trails as well that perhaps um you might have got there by yourself but what i always think a journey with a dog what is i always say that what is a hike or a run without a dog because they are they're such lovely company um yeah. and quiet <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no need to yeah. talk. But th th though there's no talking apart from commands, you we we build such a special relationship with our dogs yeah. without the need for talking. It's just a sort of uh, yeah. uh, you can almost control your dog by the look. They know the look. Your body language is so much more than than um than what it looks like so thank you so much yeah. for sharing your journey with us we will put all the details on how to contact you on our show notes and i'll put the d i wrote down the details of this of the um of the belts um we just finished up have you got anything any funny story or any crazy tip you could give people um uh either a funny story that you've had with your dogs or something um to inspire people yeah, I think so. Funny story. I think it just when you were saying about, you know, you're just giving commands and not really talking to them. I do chat away uh, to my dogs quite often um, when I'm out running um, and I forget sometimes uh, that other people can hear me. And I, I remember when I just first started running with um, Charlie and we were doing a park run and it was three laps. And I learned very early on that neither of us like laps. Um, and on the third lap, I was going, come on, we're so nearly there. One more lap to go. You're doing fantastic. You're doing really well. One more lap nearly there and then I called ahead because I was about to overtake someone so I went I'm just passing on your right with a dog and this guy went 
oh, you're talking to your dog. <laughs> he was like, I thought you were just really like encouraging. Um, and I realized I do kind of chat a lot. And, and when I run without my dog, I very often like, we'll get to a gate and I'll go easy. And I don't have my dog with me. So I'm just so used to just talking or like left, left. And like my friends are like, yeah, okay. You don't have to say it that way. So yeah. I love, so I I love talk- that. That guy thought, oh, she's so lovely. What lovely lady give me I a know, I know. And I'm like totally just talking to my dog but I think in terms of in, in I suppose inspiration one of the things I really love about Canny Cross is it doesn't matter how fast you are or how fit you are or how old you are um, it doesn't matter what breed of dog you have or how big or small they are just anyone can can get involved uh, you know involved with it and and that's what I really love and it's about you know building relationships with other people people tend to chat with you when you're running with a dog they tend to be really interested but as you said kind of building that that bond with your dog so yeah Stanley was a rescue dog he came to us with quite a lot of issues um he's very fearful of situations and when he he's very reactive to other dogs but when we're out running with a group of people he is happy he's focused his tail is at wagging and he loves it and when we finish we always you know have a cuddle and we thank you know I always thank my dogs like you know you did amazing and thank you and uh you know it's just that building that relationship really you know that if you've got a dog that's new to you or you know maybe you've lost a loved one recently and just building that connection is such a lovely way to do it and and building on your own mental health and physical health as well so I just love it as a as a sport as a kind of therapy really Mm. um so yeah I would say give it a go uh canny hiking is a thing as well so if you don't want to run but you just want to you know get out there with your dog we use all the same commands but at a you know hiking pace rather than a running pace so there's something for everyone um in it and uh yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And I'm happy if anyone wants to contact me to to give more information. For I sure. sure you are. And I bet now when you're running hard miles, you're going to get people going, oh, Lindsay, which dog's this? <laughs> oh, yeah, I do get that a lot. Who's this? People often talk to the dogs before they talk to me. <laughs> yes, outrage, the outrage. Oh, well, we can't wait to follow your journeys this year. Fingers thank crossed, you. all goes ahead. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And, well. um, and hopefully see you soon with the dogs. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed uh, listening to you and Lindsay chat along there. It was great. Now, I understand perhaps this is a bit too doggy for a lot of people. And I know a lot of runners don't like dogs, especially it seems like in parks and in towns, uh, in closed spaces, people let their dogs off the lead and then they trip you up or they bite. I find it really annoying when I'm running, especially yeah. if I'm doing a session and a dog runs to, and it's quite frightening, isn't it? If a dog runs towards you, puts you off your stride, you can't get rid of it. It's um, not the dog, is it? I suppose it's the person who's responsible yeah. for the dog that yeah. is annoying. So runners, let's be responsible dog owners. I do try and, well, I always try and run somewhere where there aren't any people. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. always helps. But if I was running anywhere with people, I would definitely keep youngest pup on the lead, nowhere near to trip. <laughs> people up a little bit of training Lindsay gives some really good tips on training tips and I also think if you're frightened of dogs I worked at a kennels as a holiday job and I got very good at fending off dogs I didn't like and I I think putting your arm up in a sort of like barrier across your body and your knee up get it down and I think (laughs) shouting shouting works a treat with dogs doesn't it and it soon it soon um notifies the owner that you do not want their dog yeah I hear, I hear not maybe horror stories, but where dogs have jumped upon people and maybe ripped clothes yeah. and uh, even kind of scratched them. I've been really fortunate. I've never, never had that. I've, had, I've been tripped up by dogs quite a few times. <laughs> well, we share our countryside with everyone has to tick along, don't we? Riders, dog walkers, and I know everyone has their own frustrations. Sure Talking about nice. being outside, the UK has been released. That's right, yeah. 29th of March, we had a bit of an update. Um, and I think people knew what was coming. We can now officially exercise in groups of six. We can also travel to exercise, which was something that, although we weren't supposed to do, um, tell by my Strava feed that people were doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, convenient work trips and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, you can now travel, but you can't stay overnight. So... 
that limits really to kind of how far you can you can travel. And I did see, unfortunately, I think with local news, she had something to do with the Lake District near Thirlmere. People had kind of made a little uh, makeshift camp. And in theory, I think maybe people wouldn't be that upset with that, but the mess they left behind oh. was really atrocious, considering they weren't even supposed to be there. Yeah. Sure, such a lack of respect for the area too. Um, it's so hard, isn't it? Because we can be so judgy, judgy, because yeah. we like. You sh- you, I can understand people's desperation to get out and to be in the countryside. Yeah. But then you also have to kind of understand that people live there. Yeah. And it 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 it, uh, it increases their anxiety with the fact that yeah. all these strangers are coming in, and then also then to leave it like that shows actually you don't really respect it. You don't deserve no. to be there. No. So now you can run in six, and now um, I know that Centurion Running have got the race license now to start their yes. races again, which are happening in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, I've also seen lots of other races aren't able to. Do all that checklist, yeah. Um, which I imagine is huge to get races up and as postponing yeah. or cancelling. I did so. see the Ultra Trail Snowdonia had postponed oh, yes, and the that. Snowden Skyline had postponed too. And what I would say to people, these guys, you know, a lot of them aren't jetting off to their private yachts at Monaco, They're these race directors. So <laughs> keep a track of their social media channels and their website for updates as opposed to bombarding them with personal messages and stuff like that because... A lot of these people are putting on events and then, you know, it's for the for the passion of the sport as opposed to kind of get rich from it. So, you know, give them a break. They're like us runners who have just trying to make a living out of the sport. We just need to be like, I'm still of the mindset, if I get to do a race this year, it's a billy bonus. And yes, yes. I'm just going to carry on with the process and enjoy the freedom. Though I think there's talk of us going back into a strict lockdown. Yeah, because your situation is different over there, isn't it? You're kind of seeing rising cases. Yeah, huge well. rise in numbers. The vaccination hasn't rolled out very quickly. There's no... There's no sign of the vaccination for our age group yeah. yet. Um, and so, and now it's coming up to Easter holidays. Yeah. So I think they'll be thinking, and we had, I think we had the huge spike because we weren't locked down for the, um, for the February half term, which is massive. Yeah. It's a month long in France. Yeah. And so now we're seeing this huge spike. And so I think they do need to do something. Um, it's just if they, if it's back to the one kilometer loop. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> God, I might go a bit crazy again. We never had that. We had the one run a day, but we never had a. You know, the distance. To, it's a real struggle to keep up with everything, to be honest, but <sighs> I don't think we had a distance, uh, a distance rule. We had at the height of it, we had a distance and a height rule. So you could only go so far and so high from your house because obviously everyone was like, well, I just ski up. Yeah. Ski back yeah, down. And yeah. they soon caught on to that. <laughs> uh, we'll wait and see. Whatever. We'll ride it out as we have all the rest of this. I really year. feel sorry for the race directors. You know, I'm a, run a small business, and but mine's not really a people facing business. So I don't have that kind of emotional connection with other people. But to have, have a, to be organizing an event that maybe has a few hundred people hopefully going to take part of it. Oh, I just, I, I'd be, I would be really stressed out. You would be, Gary. Yeah. I'm not sure you'd make it. I know. I I do. The stress well. must be when you have to press the message to say it's cancelled or postponed again. You must just be like, oh, and then going to check your email box. Saying, and a lot of the time, it's out of the event director's hands because maybe you're running through somebody's land or you need to use a property like a local village hall. And if the parish council, for example, say no, or the local landlord owner says no, then you really just, they can't do anything about it. I mean, even though the government guidance might say the event mm. can go ahead, mm. if the landowner says no, then they really can't do anything about it. Just before we came on now, talking about stress, we were talking, you were talking, you you were talking stress. about off, off. Stress, <laughs> <laughs> turning off in these times, because your business is sort of picking up again now yeah my day job um not so much the metal hangers to be honest that isn't really that uh busy as far as my business is concerned but the day job making donation boxes for museums now that unless things change these venues are going to be opening up again um i've definitely noticed an increase in people wanting their donation boxes but it was quite relaxed before then and also when you have a very small social media presence <laughs> i think a lot of people must be feeling like because everybody's majority of people are working from home how do you turn off that yeah. 
computer? How do you end your day? When yeah. do you start your day? I mean, what do you do, Gary? Do you sort of set yourself guidelines? Well, I used to have a little um, thing on my phone that would tell me you've had enough screen time. But then when I started up the YouTube channel, it just didn't work. <laughs> I've got to be honest, Eddie, I'm not managing it that well. Um, sometimes my glass is kind of bubbling over. It's uh, It's not great. But you can't, you know, if somebody um, asks you a question, and sometimes you kind of fail just so you can then switch off from that situation. You need to respond mm. to it. Um, mm. So, yeah, any tips, my goodness me, for uh, switching off? I, I remember I listened to a podcast once. I can't remember who the guy was, but he just said he tries to be present with whatever he's doing at that moment. And if it's not the moment for social media, then he's not going to be distracted with it. This is all self-inflicted. I'm not crying about it. It's, I can easily say no to everything. But yeah, I'm not managing it myself. But what about you? You said a really good thing earlier about not taking your phone upstairs. Yeah, I about... I think probably my life as well, it's compartmentalized, that word, because of the kids and their routine and their day that when I'm with them, I'm so busy, I sort of, yeah. so I've learned as well as a busy, I don't try and work if I've got the kids because that just doesn't end happy. Yes. When I've got the kids, they are, I'm doing what they're doing yeah. or, or I'm pottering around the house doing stuff. I'm a great multitasker when the kids are at home, <laughs> clean, I do the laundry, I do the cooking, I'm sorting yeah. because I don't want to do any of that when they're not here because I want to be doing <laughs> outside. <laughs> so yeah. I tend to like focus on those jobs. Yeah. And I, I turn, I, I work when they're not here. I stop at about, well, it depends what I've been doing during the day, but I sort of set myself a unit of time. And I'm a great, I'm a paper diary person. So I write down my to-do list. I get that yeah. done. Yeah. And then I write tomorrow's list. And I think that takes away the anxiety. So I'm going to do that yeah. tomorrow. I'm going to do that in that slot of time tomorrow. I'm going to tick that off tomorrow. Yeah. I don't have any problem not doing something today and yeah. doing it tomorrow. I used to, but now I'm like, no, I'm just going to. Yeah. yeah. And I never take my phone upstairs. So about half eight, nine. You get, or I put it on airplane mode at about seven yeah, o'clock because I don't want to hear, you know, nothing yeah. is, if there was an emergency, uh, you know, parents, sort of, they ring the landline, you know, that yeah. old thing, the yeah. scale gathering dust. That's in the only people who call my landline is my dad. Yeah, mum and dad, mum and dad. I mean, they would never call a mobile. God, that was outrageous. Um, and I think as well, I've learned a bit of this year, especially, it's like, I don't need to reply straight away to you. Yeah. It is not, and that was what, like with WhatsApp and social media, you feel you deserve a reply instantly. And really, yes. it doesn't. Yeah. And yeah. Um, emails and everything. Is I that why you don't better. reply to me straight away? Yeah. Well, you know, you sent me that message and I was like, no, we can talk about that. I know well, now yeah. we need to talk about it. But Ash, we don't need to talk about that before. Exactly. So yeah. you, got the, you got the special Eddie treatment. <laughs> um, and I think the same with like, I think I prefer to give people a thought through response rather than an instant. And yeah. that happens a lot with WhatsApp and email, isn't it? And I have that a lot with like clients asking me questions. This is like a really quick, shall I do this shan't I session or something? Mm. I don't understand that session. Then, you know, you need a quick response. But so, a long-term thing, I prefer to think it over because quite often my instant response isn't actually the right one. Yeah, and I need yeah. to have a think about it. And I don't have any answers. I just have to say nothing is more important, Gary, than you chilling on the sofa with Rex for an hour with your eyes yeah. half shut and a little oh, bit of I love dribble. That. I don't mind it when he pumps. I like his. <laughs> quite All happy with the on the sofa uh, at night. Oh my god! Is it small boy or dog? That's like oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. you said a really good thing earlier um, about not mixing the two like when you're with family, your family. And I remember once I tried to do a video of us all going, well, me going up Hell Vellum, but as a, we were there as a family too, and basically I didn't do a good YouTube video. And I think I've ruined all of their day because I was really stressed out. So I, I took social media off my phone for quite a long time when they were at home, when I was homeschooling, um, because it was just, um, and then I'd just go on my computer on it in the evening. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I, because I, I know I also don't want them looking, seeing me just looking at my phone Yeah. because it's too easy to just pick it up, isn't it? And start scrolling and getting lost in something. So yeah, I do yeah. try and I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but we can try no, and do no, our no, little no. bits, can't we? That's it. Small steps. Small steps. Let's talk about the competition this oh, week. Yes. It's going well, actually, isn't it? It's going really well. I was telling you before, we had a big interview on Friday night. Should we talk yeah, about go it? On, yeah, tell go on then. The so beans. we interviewed Alicia McColgan on Friday night. Beautiful Alicia McColgan. She was legs, great. Legs up to armpits. 
brilliant, brilliant, wasn't she? She was so chat. We were both quite nervous, weren't we, beforehand? Yeah. And um, we planned all our chat. We'd made a spreadsheet, but she was brilliant. She just talked and just told it. We didn't really need to. We didn't no, need to be there, really, Gary, did things we? Things in there, and she just went off and off and off, and she even. I've not got one, but you flashed a cheer charge bar as well. Which I what a pro. She was such a pro, wasn't she? For just before we interviewed her, I popped up on Facebook, um, our competition this week about how people recover after long runs or after an ultra run. And as she was talking, my Facebook notification on my computer, this is an exact example of bad multitasking, was flashing up with all these comments. I was like, oh my God, have I posted some, you know, when I just sort of found a picture to post and then I put it on, I had not really checked the post. Like, oh my God, what picture has gone up? A People like, Eddie, Eddie, take this down. It's terrible. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't. People just liked just commenting on it. Um, so it's running for another week. So if you haven't yet, pop your comment up on how you recover from a long run or a or a long race. We've yeah. pulled out a few of our favorites. Talk about Is it Instagram too? Yeah, it is Instagram and Facebook. and. Twitter. I haven't popped it on Instagram, have oh, I? okay. Ooh. Yeah, people have a picture, you know, a picture they'd like to share. Yeah, or, share it. Share it on all our channels. So there's a couple of threads that are going through the competition. You you started it, I think, with a picture of some disgusting eggs covered in tomato ketchup. Karen Nash mentioned it. Um, people, a lot of people know Karen Nash is, uh, and she said fried eggs, and I was all, I was all over that. I saw You're that all over that. Eggs, fried something. eggs, fish finger sandwiches, Guinness. Yeah. Ooh, that's yes. gone on. Yeah. Cups of tea. That's I mean that's yeah. to me that's yeah. that's the absolute gold star. One of my favourites so far is lying is doing. Doing lying on the floor activities with the kids, which is exactly what I do <laughs> after long runs. I'm like, let's do that train set that you haven't played with for eight yeah. years because you're almost a teenager. But let's build it so that I can just lie and slowly close my eyes. <laughs> yeah. So keep them coming. We're loving reading them. Um, and when are we going to draw the, the We the, will the decide winner. the winner next Tuesday, which is the 6th of April. Sixth. Oh, you're on it now. So what have you got on for the rest of the week, Eddie? Um, well, it's beautiful. It's getting hotter. <laughs> Putting my sun cream on. Yes. Um, I'm going to attempt a hard session. I haven't even looked to see what it is yet tomorrow. Just know it's on the treadmill at some <laughs> terrible percent forever. <laughs> Try and survive that. Got another tough ski. And then it's Easter weekend, isn't it? So um, uh, kids have got a long weekend off school. And we will snow. We have what? So we live in a valley. And one yeah. side is really snowy still now. And one side is clear. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So um, we will take them. Uh, Easter weekend, we're going to go on a on a really high hike picnic Excellent. with the dogs. My, it's one of my favourite things to do. I'm so sad. Is to pack up rucksacks, loads of food, yeah. dogs, kids, and we just go off for the day. And because we're in the shade till about 10, so it starts off quite chilly, and then we climb, 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 till we get in the sun, and then we just sit in the mountains, and we'll sit oh, in the sunshine, have a lovely picnic, and then we'll race down the hill and the boys will just be <laughs> in the element uh kamikaze down Excellent. the hill that's what we that's our sort of easter plans what about you uh we will have a easter dinner i don't think we can have people over so we in the garden easter barbecue oh yes yes that's true um we might get my dad over actually um so that'd be quite nice but other than that yeah we're not really planning anything Specific for Easter, the kids are outgrown the Easter hunt. Of course, yours are older because ours will still be badgering. Do you yeah. know what mine like doing? So we have the same bags we get out every year that they hide. We hide the eggs and then they find them and then they like to do it again and oh, again excellent. for about three or four days. Oh, we like, can we hide the <laughs> eggs again? Um, and because I'm a horrible mom, I'm like, you're only allowed to eat <laughs> one a day after lunch. Oh, no, we'll be all in a kind of sugar coma by about... Oh, I can imagine. You and Rex. I hope you got doggy-friendly chocolate. No, he loves biscuits. My goodness me. If I could just give him biscuits all day. Biscuits or toast. He's a big fan of toast. But my daughter, she really loves actually not eating. She loves playing a board game. So we have a bit of family oh. board game. What's your, what's your family favourites? Oh, African Star we like. Um, oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think it might be a Finnish game. And there's another one called Labyrinth, I think. Um, oh, yeah, we've got that one. Well, it starts off very we, pleasant and then descend. We try, we, oh, oh, descend into somebody <laughs> throwing thing. it. <laughs> always. It's always me too, Gary. Yeah. I We've tried to, because my sisters and I, we loved board games. Because back in the day, you know, mum and dad be like, 
you didn't have t- we didn't have TV, did we, yeah, all the time? Yeah. Board games were a big part. And so we've tried to, we often give each other for our kids the board games that we love playing. And you get yeah. the memories that come back of even the little figurines that you had. Yeah, that yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> We message each other, do you remember? <laughs> you hit me around the head. You knocked me out so hard when I won Game of Life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah, I remember using some foul language with Game of Life once when I was when I was young. <laughs> I think it was probably the first time I swore in front of my mum and dad. Oh, oh my I had three older sisters. It was a nightmare. Oh, Gary, this is all explaining so much now. <laughs> Torture me! It was. <laughs> Have a happy yeah. Easter. Rest yeah. up. Don't work too hard. Take some days off. Yes, we will do. And you, you take care. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that, everybody. My name's Gary Thwaites. I'm Eddie Sutton. And let's run to the hills. To the hills.